everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and it's time for your weekly wrap up. And yes, we are in a different space here. Check it out. This is what we're going to be uh, looking like maybe for the next uh, maybe month or two, hopefully. I'm going to get rid of that speaker back there and make some changes just to make the background look a little bit nicer. But I'm in my bonus room where I usually watch TV and movies because this is the last spot in the house I got left until my basement is done. My uh, daughter's furniture comes in tomorrow. I had to clear out of my home office. It took all weekend. It was such a small space, but I had 10 years almost worth of stuff that's been accumulating in there. So it took a while, um, but I am finally in here for the time being. And then I will be down in our new space probably again in about a month or two, but we are getting there. And I just wanted to let you know what it's going to look like here for the next uh, couple of weeks on the channel. I do want to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We got Josh Smith, Sean Kearns, Christopher Revelling, Jonathan Dominich, Christian B., and we got a few more too, by the way. Uh, we also have Brian Carter, Kirk Patzer, Bill Sugarid, and Brad Wittenbaum, uh, who contributed via YouTube fan funding. So I want to thank all of you who have contributed and those of you who continue to contribute uh, via the Patreon. That has been really helpful for uh, helping to offset some of our costs here on the channel. And uh, we're about to pick up a part-time person to help us once we move downstairs. So this fund will also uh, go towards that. And that's going to be a big help because any help that I can get prepping some things to re review uh, means I can review more stuff. And my list is getting longer and longer. So I'm really in desperate need of that help. And that uh, fund from Patreon really makes the difference. I want to thank all of you uh, for your ongoing support of the channel. It means a lot to me. So we did a lot of stuff this week. We took a look at the Dell XPS 15. That is Dell's new flagship laptop, a really nice device. You'll see that review in the master playlist linked above. We looked at the Acer Chromebox CXI2. This is the next generation Chromebox from Acer. They make a lot of Chrome OS devices, and this one is a pretty nice one. Uh, we also took a look at the Razer Wildcat, a very overpriced Xbox One game controller. And we looked at the Acer Switch 11V. Uh, so a lot of reviews this week. I was surprised I got as many done as I did, but we managed to get through it. I got a couple more on the way that you'll find very interesting. And we also wrapped up the the uh, Surface Book story. I have some closure on it finally, so you can hear the whole story from start to finish uh, on the video that I posted last night. This one really got uh, people's interest because I've had almost 6,000 views on it in less than 24 hours. So people are really interested in my Surface Book story. And I'm hearing from a lot of other people who have had a uh, similar glitchiness with their Surface Books too. So uh, hopefully others will find some resolution to their problems as well. At least I can hope they will. Uh, so new studio update. So we have all the electrical run. We've got all the data cable run. I've run Ethernet everywhere. I've got four jacks on every wall because you can never have enough home runs back to the master switch. Uh, so soon, I think probably later this week, we'll start bringing the sheetrock in uh, and start putting the walls up, which is really exciting. That's when it's going to really start to feel finished. And then I'll be picking out some carpet. And uh, hopefully within the next month or two, we will be down there and out of this temporary space and into the new one. And I'm really, really looking forward to getting myself down there. So keep, uh, keep tuned in. We'll uh, hopefully have a, a weekly wrap up from the basement soon enough. And I got a couple of miscellaneous items before I get into the Q&A to talk about. Lots to talk about today, actually. Uh, the first thing is this interesting device. This is the GPD Win. Now, you might recall uh, the GPD XD that we looked at a few weeks ago, a few months ago now. Uh, that was a little Android tablet that looked like a Nintendo DS, really good for playing retro games and whatnot. This is a similar form factor, same size screen, but it runs Windows. It's got an Atom Cherry Trail processor, uh, and it's a full Windows device in a five and a half inch screen. So they call it a five and a half inch laptop. Uh, they're on Indiegogo with this right now. I like this company because they actually have a track record that I could, I could potentially vouch for. I always say Indiegogo or any crowdfunding campaign is at your own risk. Uh, this one is as well. I've already put some money into this, the 300 bucks they're asking for this. So uh, stay tuned when it comes in. I think over the summer at some point, uh, we'll definitely review it. And this looks interesting because they also, I don't know if you can see it on here, uh, they also have a gamepad up there, very similar to the GPD XD gamepads. This is a very similar form factor, yet it's running uh, Windows. And I really find this intriguing. So we will check that out when it comes out. I'll put the link to the Indiegogo down in the video description. I also found some resolution. This has been a great week for closure on things that upset me. I also found some some closure on my Kickstarter and Zeno drone issue. And you can again see that video in our master playlist linked above. And what happened basically was uh, Kickstarter had this very successful project for a tiny drone that would have uh, the ability to move around obstacles and had all these different promises for what it could be. And it failed miserably to the point where they pretty much uh, lost everybody's money and nobody got their drone. So I was out about $240 or so. Uh, and I make these risks, by the way, for the channel because if, if it does work out, it's usually an interesting video to. 
uh, post on here. And if it doesn't, sometimes I lose money. But uh, in this instance, I actually filed a claim with my credit card company and uh, the credit card company sided with me and gave me my money back. So Kickstarter actually had to pay me uh, for what this company failed to do. And I think if you've had failed Kickstarters, it's worth a shot to go and contest it with your credit card company. Because even though Kickstarter says they're not a store, I think a lot of credit card companies might disagree with that. And uh, they certainly spent some of their own effort, Kickstarters, promoting this as an editor's pick and everything else. And they really walked away from it when all was said and done. Yet Kickstarter kept their part of the uh, profits from this failed project. And I felt that was wrong. And I raised the issue with my credit card company and they agreed with me. So uh, we got some money back there and we got the money back for the Surface Book. It has been a very good week for things that, again, upset me. So I'm happier now over those issues being resolved. So I got some Q&A this week, as we always do. The first thing involves um, someone from Twitter, Aaron A, who pointed out some interesting documentation. This is just a part of it uh, on the Android M external adoptable storage stuff. So you remember, we spent a lot of time with the NVIDIA Shield trying to figure out exactly how this, this whole adoptable storage thing works. Well, and, uh, Aaron over here found a really lengthy article on Reddit that you can peruse at your leisure if you really want to get into the nitty gritty on it. The fact that it's this complicated and takes up more than the pages you see here uh, is, I think, uh, proof enough that they need to simplify this a little bit more for consumers to help make it make more sense to people. I look at what goes on with a PS4 and the Xbox. Very easy to move apps and data around. You always kind of know where everything is. Hopefully, uh, in the next version of Android, which is probably going to be called Android N, uh, they will address some of this and make it simpler because I don't mind having encrypted storage on my SD card if it means I can put my apps where I want them to go. It'd be nice to know exactly what it's doing, which I am still quite uh, puzzled about on many different devices. Now, our next question comes from Eric Brunhammer. He's a very frequent commenter on the channel and he just picked up a new to him MacBook Pro and he was curious if there are uh, any must have pieces of software or accessories that I use uh, on my Mac that I really can't live without. And I'm gonna give you a list of software that I use on the Mac, which is what is keeping me tied to the platform. So let's take a look at some of these apps that I use that are kind of indispensable. Uh, so the first one is Keynote, which you're actually looking at right now. This is what I use to uh, make all the slides that you see on the channel. It is a very, very good PowerPoint application. Uh, this incidentally is the same app that Steve Jobs used when he did all of his presentations for Apple when he uh, headed the company. So it's a really solid, very solid, uh, uh, presentation platform that I use quite a bit and that was what got me back to the Mac in the first place after using Windows for many years. I also use Final Cut Pro a lot because that's what I produce all the video with here on the channel. Uh, but you can start with iMovie which is free and comes with every Mac that you buy. So if you wanted to get into video editing but don't want to spend 300 bucks on Final Cut Pro, uh, you can start with uh, iMovie for free and go on from there. OmniFocus is my task manager. It syncs up with all of my uh, devices. It's a really, really good, very uh, advanced and crazy, uh, complicated uh, task manager. But one, once you master it, it's really quite useful. And I've been uh, using that for a number of years now. It, it sort of keeps me organized for the most part, as long as I keep up with it. Uh, Pages and Numbers are two useful apps also. Pages is a word processor. Numbers is a spreadsheet. And what's nice is that they have a lot of built-in templates for very quickly uh, making nice looking documents. So I often use that if I want to make something look nice and don't have a lot of time to make it look nice, I can kind of drop in a template uh, from one of those two apps and get everything going on there. So I do like those apps. I believe those are free with the Mac platform also. Uh, Apple Photos is new. I like it because it syncs very well, at least for me, not for everybody, but for me, it syncs up very well to my iPad and my iPhone. And whenever I take a photo anywhere, it gets into all of my devices and it even works with raw photos off my Nikon camera. So it's kind of neat to be able to take a picture with my Nikon camera, load the raw file in on the computer and then edit it on the iPad and have those edits pushed out uh, to every device. And they're non-destructive edits also so I can revert back to the original picture too. So uh, they're doing some interesting stuff there. It's not quite there yet, but it really is quite good. Uh, Transmit and Coda are two great apps from a company called Panic. Incidentally, that is the publisher behind the new Firewatch game that a lot of people have been excited about. They've been making uh, utilities on the Mac for a long time. Transmit is an excellent FTP client and Coda is a uh, basically a web development client that has a uh, shell terminal built in. It's got a SQL client built in, uh, some really good editing software for working on websites and whatnot, as well as an FTP client. Really, uh, really nice package there. Uh, Jump Desktop is what I use to connect back to my Windows devices. It has an RDP client as well as VNC built in and it is wicked fast. It's also available on Android and iOS too. A really good uh, remote desktop client that I use quite a bit. 
uh, when I play some games, Open EMU is one of my favorites. It's a, I guess the best way to, talk, to, to consider it is like a retro arc on Android. It is a uh, all-in-one emulation application. I'll put a link to some videos I did with it about a year ago. A really nice interface and a lot of fun. A lot of supported systems on it too, so really worth checking out. And of course, VMware Fusion, so I can run Windows on my Mac. All right, so our next question is something I've been really eager to weigh in on, and I'm uh, going to finally weigh in on it, even though it's still ongoing. So uh, I got a couple of questions over the last couple of weeks about the Coleco Chameleon, and I heard from Mike Show 1016 and Ryan Landis most recently on this. And uh, what this thing is, I'll put it up on the screen here, uh, was a retro-inspired game console. And uh, we looked at this a few months ago when it was called the Retro VGS, and we had a guy named Mike Kennedy on to talk about it, who is the creator of this Phantom Project, and I stress the word Phantom Project because it really doesn't exist. So uh, what Mike did is he bought the molds to the original Atari Jaguar. It was being used as a, a dental machine for a while, and he bought the molds and wanted to make a, a game console using the same uh, plastic casing as the Jaguar. And what was unique about his project, at least his idea for the project, and what attracted me to it, uh, was he wanted to have it powered by an FPGA chip. And what these chips do is allow you to simulate another processor inside of it. So they are massively parallel chips that you can program to behave any way you want. So if you had, for example, the, the desire to uh, make your, uh, your chip into a ColecoVision, you can grab a Z80 processor and, and program that into the FPGA and have any of the accessory uh, chips that the Coleco may have used kind of programmed in there. And you've basically got a ColecoVision running on this little chip. So it's more than emulation. It actually keeps all the timings intact. Uh, for a lot of the homebrew games that are out there that are still being written, by the way, by some great companies like uh, Pico Interactive and Collector Vision, uh, they're doing some amazing stuff on this original hardware and it's not getting out to enough people because you know, most of us don't have a ColecoVision plugged into our 60 inch HD TVs and it was kind of an I thought it was a neat way to bring some of those games back to uh, general consumers. I didn't think it was going to be a big deal but I thought it was going to be more than perhaps the retro game makers are making right now and unfortunately what Mike did incorrectly was put the risk of this project on the backers. So he launched an Indiegogo campaign uh, for $2 million, and he had no prototype at the time. There was just nothing beyond uh, some ideas. He did have a hardware uh, electrical engineer on board trying to figure out how to make all this work, but um, they couldn't get it together, both as a team, but also as the hardware, to the point where they could actually show something working. And as a result, they couldn't go on Kickstarter because they didn't have anything to show, so they went on Indiegogo instead. And I did put some money in initially, and then I pulled the money out, and I said at the time that, you know, it just didn't feel right for uh, the backers to assume all the risk of a project. And I think any good crowdfunding project that I have seen had adequate investment from the creator side, whether it was the creators themselves or uh, venture capitalists or angel investors who are all taking some risk and then sharing that risk with the backers versus the backers just being all of the risk, like we saw with the Zeno drone, and look how that one turned out. So uh, in any event, his, uh, his crowdfunding campaign went kaput. Uh, Mike's team kind of fell apart as well, his hardware engineer, uh, and he had some differing opinions on how to you know, make this thing go forward. And I think in the end, it was really good that all of this happened uh, when it did. And part of the reason why all this stuff got exposed back then was because the Atari Age Forum uh, was on top of this. And these folks are uh, retro gaming enthusiasts who really understand how this hardware works. And they were very critical of what was going on and really, I, I think, actually did a real journalistic role in uh, keeping everyone honest there. So fast forward and uh, the, the retro VGS fades into the background and Mike says, you know, they're going to regroup and come up with some new ideas. So around Christmas time, he announces that they're going to come up with the Coleco Chameleon and he got the branding from uh, Coleco and Coleco doesn't exist as it used to back in the 80s. Coleco was a big toy company located right here in Connecticut, as a matter of fact, uh, who made the Cabbage Patch Kids and my beloved ColecoVision and many other things. Um, and what happened was they went kaput and kind of got acquired, and, you know, they just kind of disappeared. And uh, the Coleco name and the games and all the IP that they owned went to a holding company that now owns the rights to the ColecoVision and some of, some of the games. And we've seen the Coleco flashback that I reviewed about a couple years ago um, and some other things that you might be seeing in the near future with some Coleco branding are not actually made by Coleco, they're made by somebody else who's licensing the names and sharing uh, the revenue back. And that was what Mike was hoping to do here. So basically what he was going to do is relaunch exactly what he had before, uh, except this time he claimed to have a prototype. So uh, he went to Toy Fair and went to Coleco's booth to show it off. And uh, at the fair, he posted some pictures of this device and uh, immediately the folks on Atari Age went ballistic because when he took a picture of the back of the device, I'll send some links up so you can see all this stuff as it developed. 
Um, it basically was the back of a uh, Super Nintendo Junior, a SNES Junior that they packed into the, the casing here. Now, Mike's uh, side of the story at the time was that uh, this was, in fact, their FPGA-based machine, uh, but the, they didn't have all the video connections ready yet, so they just grabbed the back of a Super Nintendo Junior and attached it to their system. It's kind of a, a, a shady story because he never actually took the cover off to show everyone that's exactly what it was. So uh, a lot of folks just really think that they just took a Super Nintendo and stuffed it in the shell, and that was it. So uh, the Kickstarter was supposed to launch at the end of February, and uh, instead of launching, it, it, they said, oh, we got some great offers and we really can't move forward right now because we want to get this thing you know, ready for these retailers that are really interested in it. We made a lot of great contacts at Toy Fair, so we want to pull it back a little bit uh, and, and just get it even better. So they did, though, to kind of hopefully uh, soothe the concerns of the naysayers, posted up some photos of this device, and it, it took the, uh, the folks on uh, the Atari Age Forum all of about 20 minutes to find out that this machine that they were showing here uh, was, in fact, a, uh, a PCI DVR capture card from the late 90s, early 2000s, and it was just stuffed into the case and just a blatant fraud here. I mean, this is really pushing it now. So where this is at right now is uh, Coleco has given uh, the retro team who is making this device a couple of days to come up with the actual prototype or they're pulling their branding out. So this story is not over yet. We'll probably talk about it again uh, next week, but stay tuned because there is probably more to come on this. But uh, I have never in my life seen something as bad as this uh, appears, and uh, we'll see where things go. Now, I've got some things. If you want to read more about this disaster, if you like this kind of drama, you'll love uh, these articles here. So check out uh, Motherboard here, which ran a pretty good article that was a good summation of everything. Uh, you can find that at lon.tv slash Coleco1. That'll take you right to Motherboard. I also want you to check out the Atari Age Forum, and you can watch this whole thing un unravel as it, as it happened. It's kind of a real-time uh, look as uh, things were going on. And I'll tell you what, this is a really, again, a really good uh, work of gaming journalism, collaborative gaming journalism uh, by the folks who uh, post to this forum very regularly. So you can, they actually indexed everything so you can kind of get a look as to what exactly is going on on here. But um, I, I think this is the last we'll see of this thing. And I am really glad that uh, the Atari age folks spent the time to uncover all of this before people got defrauded, which is really what this was about to become. It is an outright fraud. I hope I could take that those words back at some point, but I doubt we're going to see an actual prototype out of this when all is said and done. Now, uh, what I was not aware of is that this FPGA concept does actually exist, and you can buy one of these things that does exactly what the Retro VGS was supposed to do uh, right this minute. So this is called the Mist FPGA computer. I, I referred to it a couple of weeks ago because I have one on the way. I check my mailbox every day, all excited to see if it's going to be in there. And this does exactly what Mike Kennedy was pitching. You can load up, um, I think, probably about 12 or 13 different systems, including the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. Um, it does the Amiga computer, the Atari ST, uh, an Apple II Plus. I mean, it's amazing. It does all this stuff. I'm so excited for this thing. And uh, you'll notice on here, it's got two uh, DB9 ports, so you can actually plug in original game controllers that have that port. So the old Atari controllers, the old Sega controllers, uh, even the ColecoVision controllers should plug right into that. Uh, what's even better is that it's not cartridge-based. You can load up your uh, ROMs on an SD card, and it all just seems to work. And it's uh, a, you know, essentially a hobbyist project. It is not a commercial company per se. It's being sold by a few companies in Europe, but uh, this is a labor of love by the people who really want accurate uh, simulation of old computer systems. So if you wanted to do what Mike Kennedy and his crew was pitching with his retro VGS, you can buy one of these for about $200 or so uh, and get it what you were looking for uh, in something that is supported by a community, which I think is really where uh, people should uh, be spending their money. So check that out. I've got one on the way. We're going to do a live stream, as I mentioned, about two weeks ago. Once it gets here, I've been waiting on, again, anxious, anxiously waiting for this thing to get here. And when it does, we'll uh, I'll probably do a couple of live streams. I think when it gets here, I'm just going to live stream me trying to figure it out, and then we'll do uh, a more formal live stream when I actually understand how it works, and we'll give away that, that uh, a couple of things that I talked about giving away earlier, too. So this week on the channel, in our new temporary spot, we're going to be taking a look at the Intel Compute Stick, and this actually comes in tomorrow, so my hope is tomorrow night to have a video up. Now, this picture is not the picture of the one I'm getting. This is the Core M version, which isn't out yet. Uh, we are getting the Atom Cherry Trail version of the Compute Stick uh, tomorrow, and that is the next iteration of the Compute Stick we looked at last year. Now, in interestingly, 
Uh, the Compute Stick for 2016 is running with the same chip as the Kangaroo Mini PC that we looked at that I really liked. It cost $99. So we'll see how the Compute Stick stacks up to uh, the Kangaroo because it is the same chip and we'll see how they perform uh, versus each other as well as comparing it to last year's stick. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 is here. I haven't had a chance yet to actually do anything with it because I was too busy moving everything into this room, but uh, soon I will get into that. I have a few suggestions from people as to what they'd like to see. I still have some time, so definitely let me know if you want me to test something specifically on it. I'll try to do it, if not uh, in the video it, that I'll be doing, uh, but maybe in a future one. But definitely uh, leave me some suggestions and I will try to do something with those uh, as I'm putting together that review. We're also, we are going to, I promise, I know a few of you are, I think James Roofer who's been uh, on me on this one. We are going to look at this mini PC on a stick with an ethernet port. Just sometimes things come in that take priority and just it seems to be happening a little too much these days, but uh, we will get to that. I'm just going to keep it on there just, just so I can push myself to get it done finally so I can take it off the slideshow here. If you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon like our folks did at the beginning of the show uh, to make a monthly contribution. You can also uh, do a one-time contribution at YouTube Fan Funding at lon.tv. If you do fan funding, do let me know that you contributed because uh, YouTube doesn't let doesn't actually notify me when somebody uh, contributes money there all the time. So I'd like to thank everyone who contributes. So definitely uh, let me know if you did so I can give you a shout out on the wrap up. And if you want to help the channel in a passive way, you can go to lon.tv slash Amazon and anything you buy there uh, will benefit the channel because we get a small portion of the sale. So it doesn't affect your price, but we do get a small portion of that sale uh, anytime you visit Amazon from that link or any of the links that I post below in my uh, video descriptions. Now, if you want to connect with the channel, there's light ways to do that too. Lon.tv slash email will get you on my email list. I don't email all that often except when I have something interesting happening that I want people to know about. So uh, those are usually live stream announcements. And when I get that FPGA computer, you'll find out there first. We also have my forums at lon.tv slash forums. We've got the Facebook page as well. And I've been doing a lot on Facebook lately. So uh, go over there and check it out. We've got almost 1,200 people on the Facebook page now, which is cool. We still have 80,000 here on YouTube, so we can maybe get a few more over there. Why not? Uh, we also have the Reddit page, which has been growing slowly, but surely at lon.tv slash Reddit. I do try to monitor all of this stuff. Uh, so definitely engage with me there and some of the other viewers of the channel. So I want to thank everyone for watching. And I really do want to make it clear that I really appreciate uh, your viewership. Even if you can't contribute via Patreon or on the fan funding thing, uh, viewership is what makes this channel grow. So just by watching videos that I make, uh, you help the channel. And I can't thank 80,000 people every week. And I don't actually have a list of them all either. But I would if I could because it does mean a lot uh, just to have your continued viewership and all the feedback that I get from you is really helpful as well. And I, what I love about the audience is that uh, you pull no punches. So when I do something you don't like, I hear about it. And uh, even if I don't respond to that, uh, that constructive criticism, I like the constructive criticism, uh, I, I am definitely reading it and uh, integrating what your suggestions are into the production workflow here. So I appreciate that. I'd love to hear some comments on my background and maybe some things I could do differently in here. Let me switch back to the other view. I got I to gotta put something over there. So give me some suggestions and I will uh, try to get that in there for the next weekly wrap up and hopefully for tomorrow night's review of the Compute Sticks. That'll do it for this week. A long one tonight. This is Lon Sivan. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporter Shabib. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.